Hey everyone, welcome to Logan's Mosh Pit. Glad to have you here. Do me a favor, please subscribe if you haven't already. It's time for another episode of Rock and Read. Today we'll be reading Chapter 3 of the Tom Petty biography. A Bruce Petty quote kicks off Chapter 3. It says, We got a gun and holster every Christmas. That was our thing. Here we go. Earl Petty likes seeing his sons playing in the backyard. It was exactly what American boys that age were supposed to be doing. When they weren't out back playing, armed and ready to shoot, they were watching every western they could on television. The Rifleman, Bonanza, Have Gun, Will Travel, Gunsmoke, Wanted Dead or Alive. It was as if the boys were either watching the Indians die or taking care of the situation themselves, helping Earl kill off his people. When Elvis came into Tom's world, however, Bruce Petty would have to handle the Indians on his own. Like so many young people in America, his brother was ready to replace the heroes of comic books and westerns with the rock and roll stars of the day, or the day before, as was the case with Petty's interest in mid-50s rock and roll. He got his first taste of the music of Elvis, Jerry Lee Lewis, and Little Richard a few years after they'd hit. They say Tom Petty's uncle, Earl Jernigan, had one of the rubber costumes from the creature from the Black Lagoon hanging in his office. Jerrigan worked with film crews that came to Florida for location work, so it's a possibility. He was from the North, a little different from the other men in Petty's world. Jernigan was different, and didn't always suffer the others with grace. He married into a crazy family, and he knew it, and he stayed away from it, says Petty. So, I didn't even know until years later that he was in show business, doing television, doing movies, 110 episodes of Sea Hunt. I had no idea. I'm bitter about that, that I wasn't better informed. But he didn't want to have anything to do with anybody in my family, and I can't really blame him. Jernigan's wife, Evelyn, Kitty Petty's older sister, broke form the day she came to ask if Petty, 10 at the time, wanted to join a few of his cousins and meet Elvis Presley. The star was in Ocala filming Follow That Dream. Petty remembers a line of Cadillacs, every one of them white, pulling up to Ocala's Main Street. Men with pompadours and mohair suits stepped from the cars, as if the whole thing was choreographed. When Elvis emerged, he was otherworldly in his beauty. You could dress up the star's entourage to look just like him, but it would only underscore the contrast between Elvis and anyone around him. Presley's was a freak beauty. Jernigan made introductions, and Elvis shook Tom Petty's hand. The boy stared up at the star, unable to do more than that. Fans were everywhere in the streets of Akala, making it difficult for the filmmakers. Within days, Petty says he traded his slingshot for a box of 45s, many of them Presley classics. Elvis became a symbol of a place Tom Petty wanted to go. In time, the Beatles would read the map to get there. When it came, the British invasion was, of course, a Copernican revolution. Ed Sullivan was the mechanism through which the core message was delivered. You can do this. A generation heard it. In Up Homes Across America, an alternative was presented. For Tom Petty, from that point on, it was going to be a battle about many things. The length of his hair, and the state of his report cards among them. The opponents being father and school. But life would begin to display its offerings. He had only a few years to wait. Lying awake through those nights, waiting, he could see Elvis's face, hear the songs in his head. Petty got his first guitar, an almost unplayable Stella, in 1962, two years before that Ed Sullivan performance. It wasn't much more than a shape to hold, an idea with a strap, but it was enough. That was the same year that the Cuban Missile Crisis arrived to give Cold War anxieties a basis in reality. If you were living in America at that time, it was a scary moment. If you were living in Florida, it was some terrifying going down in your backyard. Earl Petty responded by building a bomb shelter. He arranged cinder blocks around a leveled area. The shelter would have to be above ground. You wouldn't dig too deep in that part of Florida because of sinkholes. They could pull your house down into another world. Earl had in his mind an image of carefully stacked cans of beans and soup and peaches and heavy syrup. A small two-burner cook stove, bunks, board games, his wife and two boys in the lamplight. Security for his family in the face of uncertainty. His eldest son's friends over after school looked on with interest. Later, they'd see pictures in life, 
like the ones of the couple who'd honeymooned for two weeks in an 8 by 11 foot bomb shelter, and they think of Earl. He wasn't the only man building such a box down that way. There was another just down the block, but he was the only one most of the kids knew personally. The bomb shelter was never finished, but Earl was among those who did something, or almost did something, about the abstract fear that hung over the nation. Even as the work slowed, Earl remained attracted to the idea of showing his boys what it meant to be a man. Not that they picked up on it the way he hoped. They never did, particularly his eldest. I remember thinking, I don't want to be stuck in this bomb shelter with Earl, Petty says. I asked him where the bathroom was going to be and he points at a bucket. I'm thinking, we're all gonna in that bucket? We were aware that the Russians might drop a bomb on us. If you went through town, you'd see signs that said, public fallout shelter. And I knew we weren't far from Cuba. But what could I do? Nothing. But my father's solution didn't have a lot of appeal. The crisis passed. The floor and the walls were done, Bruce Petty recalls. It was all concrete blocks, but he never even got a door on it. It just sat out there in the backyard. <laughs> Still there, I guess. David Mason was friends with Tom Petty from second grade through junior high, briefly a part of Petty's first band, The Sundowners, later a founding member of Todd Rundgren's Utopia and in Jackson Brown's touring band. Mason recalls playing around in the unfinished bomb shelter. The holes in the cinder blocks were filled with dirt, says Mason. I think there might have been an inner wall and an outer wall. No door, though. No roof. But I guess Mr. Petty wanted to protect his family. Finished or unfinished, the bomb shelter served a purpose. Life at home was easier for the petty boys when the enemy was out there. It distracted their father. Life was more complicated when the battle came inside. There wasn't a bomb shelter for that. My father was nice enough to me in his old age, Tom Petty says. In his way, he tried to apologize. But I think he always felt that he wasn't supposed to get too close to his children. As a parent, you just made sure the kids didn't die. You fed them, and then you sent them out into the world. But you shouldn't necessarily get to know them. And after he started beating me, I thought, I'm not going near that mother. <laughs> Strange as it might sound, I think both my mother and my father were probably scared that I was gay. They were always trying to push me into playing baseball or whatever, and I didn't want to. I liked art, and I liked clothes, and after the Beatles, I liked having my hair long. I'm sure Earl translated that into, whoa, he's going the wrong way. He's not doing what other boys are doing. And they didn't know how much I loved girls because I sure as wasn't going to bring a girl home to that. I didn't ever discuss a girl with them. I didn't want my parents involved in that in any way. I remember Tom saying, my dad's going to kill me, recalls Tom Whedon, a neighbor first, but finally one of Petty's closest early musical collaborators. He had just gotten his report card. I was like, what'd you get? He tells me, two D's and three F's. I remember thinking, wow, this could be the dumbest guy I've ever met. I was fascinated. Of course, I soon found out he wasn't dumb at all, but he sure didn't do much to connect at school. Actually, that one was straight F's with D T minus and art, Petty says. Someone gave me some special ink so I could turn an F into a B, but it ended up eating the paper. Made it even worse, but I thought it was all kind of funny. I probably gave it a shot at school for about a minute. There was a point when I realized, especially in high school, that the men and women teaching me may not be as bright as me, and I couldn't suffer that. I looked at them and thought, I'm not really sure you know what you're doing. I could excel at anything I had an interest in, even a vague interest, like in English. I got good marks because I didn't mind reading something. I liked stories. That hooked me. I could get into how words came together, how sentences were built, how stories were put together. All that interested me. It was effortless. I used to get these horrible report cards, but there'd be an A in English. My mom would go, why do you only study for this class? But the truth is, I wasn't studying for any of the classes. That just happened. With math and other subjects that didn't interest me, I couldn't bluff. I mean, once I had learned basic arithmetic, I didn't see why I needed to learn more. I thought, nobody's ever going to ask me to do an algebra problem, and I don't give a about this. I ended up skipping a lot of school. I remember taking chorus with my friend Mike Nixon later on. We skipped class all year long. Then Mike shows up one day and says, the chorus recital is tonight. We gotta be there. I thought he was out of his mind, but he says, we'll fail if we don't show. So we go walk out into the auditorium with the entire chorus, 
kind of move our mouths along. The chorus teacher is just looking daggers at us down front. The school sent letters to our parents, and all this went down. Petty shrugs. I recognize that education is a good thing, but I just wasn't made for school. The only draw for Petty was the girls. There was a string of obsessions that filled his mind with light. He could see a beautiful face and build something with it. For a kid dealing with trouble at home, those early crushes had the power to transport. It was the first promise of another life within the one he had been given. I remember all these girls, but I can't remember a single teacher, Petty says, smiling. I had a remarkable taste in women. I remember going to school for the first time and seeing this girl that was just drop-dead gorgeous. And I mean, this was kindergarten. I made my way over to her and pretty much sealed the deal. This was my gal, if only it had lasted. She turned into the best-looking girl Gainesville ever had, so good-looking that in high school one of the teachers ran off with her. When Petty was at Howard Bishop Junior High, he discovered that the field had gotten crowded. It was a small school, Petty says, and I found this one beautiful girl, Cindy, the prettiest girl there, and she showed some interest in me. I probably made more of it than she did, probably thought it was more real than she did. I imagine every guy she met wanted to take her out. But I still remember the day that it hit me that we weren't an item like I thought we were. It was traumatic for me. I remember the walk home, just feeling I got my heart broken. If the initial feeling of love were outsized for a boy his age too, so was the crash. It changed him. After that, it would be a matter of protecting himself, of being sure it didn't happen again. He pulled back. There would be girlfriends, but the relationships he pursued would be safe. Nothing Petty made sure that could hurt him. I'll tell you something I've been thinking about lately, Petty says. That phrase, getting your feelings hurt, I realized that what I equated it to in childhood was something almost paralyzing. When I got my feelings hurt, I really couldn't have felt worse. It was physical. My throat clamped up and I just wanted to die. I would radiate pain. It took quite a while for this to change. It only dawned on me later in life that getting your feelings hurt can be wider than that. You can get your feelings hurt without it crippling you. But as a young man and as a child, there was something unusual going on. It wasn't right. It was very sensitive, too delicate. I could be tough as in other areas, but when it came to, you know, emotional stuff, I could break like a twig. I felt like I had to protect myself. I almost had to close part of myself down. I remember thinking, enough chasing these beautiful girls around junior high. I'm not cut out for this. The trouble with his father, however, wasn't something he could handle by shutting a part of himself down. A deeper distrust of adults spread in him. There was something about him, Tom Whedon insist, something that would always set off adults. Even when we were kids, Tom Petty was the guy that rubbed them the wrong way. They just picked up on it, even if he didn't say anything. It was just his body language or something. The abuse at home continued into junior high school, even escalated, and it was like a scent Petty gave off. My father got me out in the woods and on the water more than a few times, he says. And it was always like he had some point to make, something to teach me about who he was and I guess who I was or who he thought I was. Earl Petty felt he needed to show his son that he could knock an alligator out, that he could swing a snake over his head and snap its neck. So he did. Tom Petty remembered it, of course. It worked in that sense, but the son didn't remember it the way his father intended. For a while, with too much friction between them, Tom went to live with his grandmother. But that didn't last. In part because Earl felt that his authority was being challenged. It lasted until he figured out I had gone, says Petty. Then he came over there, took me by the <laughs> hair, and dragged me home. It lasted until he kicked in the screen door, kicked it right off the hinges, bent the door, beat the living <laughs> out of me all over the house. I mean, one of the worst beatings I ever took. And then he brought me home. Not long after, Petty found out that his mother, the one person who really knew Earl and might be able to protect her son, was sick. As much as they could, Earl and Kitty kept her illness from their children. The boys knew enough to grasp that something was wrong, but no one told them exactly what was happening. While Earl had moved in and out of jobs during his son's childhood, Kitty worked at the tax collector's office dealing with car registrations. She took Tom along with her to work one day, and he saw that she was happy there loved by the people she worked with. Her natural warmth was in strong contrast to her husband's country sensibility. Work, her eldest son realized, was an easier place for her to be. Getting sick would eventually mean she couldn't even have that. 
Kitty was the buffer between Tom and his father, a woman who had gotten in a little too deep but would never consider getting out. It just wasn't done. She should have left him, Petty says. I don't know why she wouldn't leave him. The health problems, which would only get worse, merely cemented a bad situation. But she didn't have the heart to tell her sons a whole lot. The word chemotherapy was heard around the house well before one of Tom's friends explained to him what it meant. Their mother was spending more and more time in her bedroom, the door shut, and then it was bouts with epilepsy. There were periods when she seemed better, but they didn't last. Childhood in the traditional sense ended early, without anyone really noticing. At a certain point, the town would raise the boy. Gainesville will always figure larger in Tom Petty's story than the Los Angeles to which he relocated almost 40 years ago. It's more than a backdrop. Something connects a man to the hometown he pushes against to get going in the first place, and Gainesville was made for rock and roll. The University of Florida's remarkable post-war growth aligned with the music's golden years. Rock and roll was on the radio, played live in a network of clubs and at frat houses, coming out of cars everywhere. The right equipment could be found at Lipham Music, where the local bands could hang out so long as their gig money found its way to the cash register. Gainesville was its own story. In so many ways, the town wasn't part of the Florida that would carve its image into the popular fantasies of post-war America. The white sand beaches, acres of amusement parks, the limitless promise of space travel? No. The Florida to which Gainesville belonged was nothing but Georgia, with a few miles tacked on and a university thrown in. You could say that the university made the town, but the town didn't just go away. This was the deep south with the door punched in its side for strangers to walk through. And those strangers brought ideas and customs and diversions and long-playing records that would transform the lives of the locals. The town and the university cross-fertilized. If you went a few miles down the road, Petty insists, the same rules didn't apply. In Gainesville proper, however, a young new America was beginning to realize itself. Because of that place and its particulars, Petty was, in mind and spirit, out of the family house years before he left the bedroom he shared with his brother. He was ready for a new family, even before the Beatles arrived. But through the Beatles' example, he was shown how to start one. The Sundowners would just be the first. From that point on, nothing was ever going to mean more to him than the band he was in. From the Sundowners to the Epics, Mud Crutch to the Heartbreakers, every decision would be made in relation to how he could best keep the band together. If family was bull and girls were a beautiful road to a lonely place, the band might be different. That was the thinking. There was something in the Beatles' faces that looked like freedom. When I was a kid, I would have loved to have been a rock and roll star, Petty says. I just didn't understand how you got to be one. How did you suddenly have a mohair suit in an orchestra? But the minute I saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, and it's true for thousands of us, there was a way to do it. The Stella Acoustic was replaced with the K-Electric. He found a couple of guys in the neighborhood, Richie Henson and Robert Crawford, and they started getting together, identifying one another by the length of their hair. Wooly Bully was the first song Petty got on top of. Petty met Dennis Lee at a teen dance, and now there were three guitar players and a drummer. They called themselves the Sundowners. Before they actually made music as a four-piece, they were already scheduled to play their first gig, intermission at a dance where a DJ was the main act. They played four instrumentals, including House of the Rising Sun and Walk Don't Run. After they performed, a young man came up to the 14-year-old Petty, asking if his band had ever played a frat gig, then asked if they wanted to. It never stopped from that moment on, says Petty. Tom Whedon moved to Gainesville from San Diego in the summer of 1964. His father had landed a teaching job at the University of Florida, an assistant professorship in the university's physics department. With ten kids in the Whedon family, all named after saints, there was a lot of unchecked activity in the home, but they always assembled for dinner. As their mother liked to remind them, they weren't gypsies. But with that many children, it was a fine line. But still in San Diego, Miss Whedon would pin a name and address onto her son Tom's shirt. When they first arrived in Gainesville, the Whedons rented a place on 23rd Street, but moved to 412 Northeast 15th Avenue the following year. Their father bought a plot of land and built a house. Behind them was a park. On the other side of that park was the Petty's home. The Petty's were at 1715 Northeast 6th Terrence. Gainesville is divided into quadrants, with Main Street the north-south divider and the University Avenue bisecting the town east-west. If you go down 6th Terrence along the park, explains Tom Whedon, past 16th Avenue, the Petty's house is on the right. 
it's a single story with what they call a Florida room, which was really a porch that was a part of the house, tiled and all. Go up a step and there's a living room with a dining area in it and a little kitchen to the right. Go straight back and there's a hallway with the parents' bedroom to the left and Tom and Bruce's to the right, a bathroom in between. That's pretty much it. The neighborhood was largely working class, but being a college town, there was a mix, even there in the northeast section of town. If Dr. Leiden was a professor at the university, that didn't make them rich, but they were safely in the middle class. The northwest part of town was wealthier. Lamont Tinch, his father a judge, lived over there. The southeast was black. The university was the southwest quadrant. Tom Leiden was already a part of the Gainesville music scene before he met Tom Petty. One of his older brothers, Bernie, could play a good flat-top guitar. Bernie knew and loved country music. But that didn't mean he knew a lot about country people or about where that music came from. And neither did his younger brother. That would soon change. Just a few years later, Tom Whedon, with or without his mother's permission, would start making his way across the park to the Petty's home. He'd even be invited in for dinner where he would sit quietly, politely, mostly unable to follow the conversation because the accents were too thick. Except for his friend Tom's. Probably because he watched so much television, Whedon figures, he just didn't sound like them. I could understand him. Before the two Toms met, however, the Sundowners got fully underway, with the band members' mothers driving them to gigs. In the room that had once housed the inventory of Petty's dry goods, there was now a rehearsal space, with just enough room for a drum kit, a few amps, and a few boys. Kitty and Earl Petty couldn't fail to recognize that their son was up to something. They even checked the band out at the Moose Lodge. They might have been impressed, but not so impressed that they didn't draw the line when the next bad report card came in. My mother said, that's it, you're out of the band. Patty remembers, it killed me. So much that she couldn't keep it up for more than a week. The hot group in town at the time was the Continentals, which featured Don Feldner and Stephen Stills. When Stills left the group, Bernie Whedon came in. Feldner and Whedon had already been playing together, bluegrass stuff. With Stephen Stills gone, Bernie got an electric guitar, and the Continentals were over. The Monty Quintet was born from the ashes. The group would hit the frat circuit hard and become a celebrated local band competing against Dwayne and Greg Allman's early outfits in a few different battles of the bands. Bernie Whedon would eventually head west, and after playing in the Flying Burrito Brothers with Graham Parsons, join the Eagles, bringing Don Feldner in not long after. Tom Whedon was picking up plenty, hanging around the Monty Quintet whenever he could, going to gigs by age 12. When a friend brought him by the Petty House so that they could listen to a Sundowner's rehearsal from outside a window, Tom Whedon made indirect but significant contact with a neighbor who would eventually become his bandmate. But their paths remained separated for the time being. David Mason, Petty's childhood friend, returned to Petty's life as a sundowner, but only after playing with Feldner in the Continentals while still in middle school. It blew our minds that he was in Continentals, recalls Petty, but David Mason was that good. When Petty called him to play in the Sundowners, Mason went ahead and checked it out. I was a little bit underwhelmed. In the Continentals, I was around a lot of older guys, says Mason, learning a lot real quickly. This was different. Pretty soon, I left the Sundowners and joined one of the college bands. They were kids, but the ones who could play would often mix in an older crowd. There was no distinction between varsity and junior varsity. Strict divisions that applied elsewhere often didn't in the world of local bands. For all of them, there was a perceived fluidity between what they saw on television. The Stones, Beatles, Animals, Dave Clark Five, what they heard on WGGG, and what they themselves played in venues like The Place and The Moose Club. They were a part of something much larger, even if their heroes seemed as distant as myth. 60s rock and roll grew up furiously, without a whole lot of adult oversight or involvement. It was a true teenage movement. There was a lot of stuff aimed at young kids, explains Charles Ramirez, who was one of those teenagers, and would later promote shows for Petty's bands. It really started to hit me when I was in 8th grade and saw Dwayne and Greg Allman in the Allman Joys of the local American Legion Hall. With matching suits, ruffled shirts, and Petty singing lead, the Sundowners played every weekend. Initially, Kitty Petty didn't believe her son when he claimed that the money on his bureau was from playing shows. He was only 14 and 15 while in the Sundowners. Before that, she'd sneak him some money when he needed it behind Earl's back. Now he was making his own cash, and soon enough would be working a lift of music. From the parental perspective, it was a question of, how could it last? From the teenager's perspective, it was simply a matter of making sure it did. 
The first time you count four and suddenly rock and roll is playing, it's bigger than life itself, says Petty, describing his first shows. It was the greatest moment in my experience, really. I couldn't believe it was happening, that we were making music. No one could understand what a blast to the moon that is unless they've done it. Once we got going, we covered James Brown's Live at the Apollo, Animals Hits, Paul Revere and the Raiders. It was a great period. Playing the songs meant getting inside them. Even that early, Petty could find clues about what made a song work, what made one better than the next. He was quietly taking it all in. No aspirations beyond the next gig, learning to play bass, learning to sing. The fragility of what he had found, however, its fleeting nature, hadn't yet dawned on him. We did these gigs called socials, which were these little gatherings hosted by fraternities, says Petty. You could do one of those around 6 p.m., then go play a dance somewhere. So, we had a social and a dance one Friday night, and Dennis Lee, the drummer, is yelling at me as we load gear out of my house. He was a bossy guy, ordering me around. Earl leans out the window, says to me, Don't take that from him. You don't have to be talked to like that. I was like, yeah, I know. We got to the gig, and it keeps going. Dennis is just on my butt, laying down the wall. He hits my rage button. I said, give me any more and I'm going to leave. He says, I'd like to see that happen. I'd kick your butt. So I just turned to one of my buddies who was with me, told him to help me load my gear out. This is the way you are when you're 15. I get my amp and stuff loaded out, turn around. There's a fist in my face. My own drummer beat the living out of me. Beat me bad. The frat guys just stood around in a circle cheering it on. I remember my mother crying all night because I was so up. That was kind of the end of me working with Dennis Lee. As fast as he was in a band, Petty was out of one. But knowing there was conflict with Lee, he was out ahead of this one. Maybe he was learning to take care of himself. It was 1966 when the Epics asked Petty to join their group. Ricky Rucker, Rodney Rucker, and Dickie Underwood liked enough of what they saw him and wanted him to come in as their singer. Not that the audition went particularly well, but they had just canned their first singer, Herbie Bohannon, so the timing was good. I remember sitting in their living room having to sing a couple of songs for them, Petty says. I did a little black egg by the Nightcrawlers. Rodney responded by saying, That's the worst singing I've ever heard. Right. <laughs> Ricky Rucker convinced his brother to give the singer another chance, however, and by the audition's end, Petty was asked to do a gig with the band. The trouble between Petty and Dennis Lee eventually made the epics look like a solution. If initially, it was little more than what Petty calls a busman's holiday. By the end of Petty's first show as an epic, he had found himself setting his bass aside and fronting a band. It was at the Graham Hall, one of the university's dormitories, recalls Dickie Underwood. Petty was like a wild man all over the stage. That was probably the first time he got to be the front guy, and he loved it. And so did the people watching us. We all said, this guy is good. So we told him that he'd have a lot more fun with us than he would with the Sundowners. That was our argument. The bass player that Epics had been working with, an older guy in his 20s, was let go. Though Petty remembers the trial gig being not as Graham Hall, but one of the rougher places the Epics favored. After that first show, he was out of the Sundowners and into the Epics. The new bass player, sharing lead vocals with Rodney Rucker. What really interested Petty, however, was the fact that the Ruckers had gigs booked. But he was made to realize that not all gigs are equal. The Sundowners played more posh places than the Epics, Petty explains. Nice teen clubs and moose halls. The Epics would just play down and dirty places. Dickie and I would ride around and find these little places to rent. Little Hall, says Ricky Rucker. I wish my name was as catchy as Ricky Rucker. We found this one hole in the wall, the Orange Lake Civic Center, that we could give for like five dollars. We'd make posters and put them up. We'd sell Cokes at the show. We were good getting gigs. When Petty joined, he was hanging around Tommy Whedon. I guess they met through Whip of Music, and I saw that Tommy Whedon was better on guitar than I was. I thought, we could use this guy. The lineup solidified. Tom Petty and Tom Whedon were now in the band together. Rodney Rucker, not happily, was moved off guitar, becoming the Epic's primary lead singer. They covered songs by the Rascals, the Stones. Whedon would slow down 45s to figure out the chord changes and solos. They had what Ricky Rucker calls a primitive sound. By that time, Earl Petty had started to make it his business to try talking his son out of doing the music thing. But he couldn't help himself. He did like the Ruckers and Dickie Underwood. Earl would appear out back when they were around, and they liked him too. He approved of it when Petty started hanging with us. 
Dickey Underwood insists, because we liked hunting fish, and he was an old man from Marion County out in the woods, Ricky Rucker agrees. He was like all the older men we ever knew, my brother and I and Dickey, so we got a kick out of him. Tom Wayne puts it somewhat differently. Dickey said to me several times, well, Mr. Petty likes us because we're normal. The Ruckers didn't just like hunting and fishing, they liked drinking and chasing girls. A lot. We always thought, this is the ultimate party, Ricky Rucker explains. It was all about meeting girls and going crazy, doing crazy things. Not jail type things, but crazy. Tommy was all for having fun, but he had a whole thing about the music. He really wanted to play music. The Ruckers and Underwood approved of that focus, as long as the music didn't get in the way of being in a band. Leedon and Petty began to distinguish themselves, shape their own views of how much time and energy a group should put into getting their show right. When Tampa's Tropics, the band with whom Charlie Souza played, got a strobe light and raised their performances a notch with its effect, the Ruckers wanted one for the epics. But that wasn't all the Tropics did. They also spent time perfecting their dance steps, learning new covers, writing and arranging a few originals. Their show even had a James Brown portion that didn't just feature Brown's hits. It included the cape routine for which Brown was known. They had the theater down. The Tropics made it onto American Bandstand, and they were buying houses and cars with gig money as teenagers. The Ruckers and Dickie Underwood didn't put that whole picture together in the way that Petty and Whedon did. The biggest problem we had with Tom Whedon and Dickie Underwood insists was that he took things way too seriously sometimes. The age difference between Petty, the even younger Whedon, and the rest of the band was defining. The two younger members sometimes felt like foot soldiers in the Ruckers, a means to an end is how Petty describes their role. At the Live Oak Civic Center, the Ruckers brought Dog and Feldner along. Feldner had been hanging around the Ruckers for a while, explains Petty. I remember there were poker games and drinking and girls and all that, a moving party. Tommy and I were second-class citizens. I mean, even in Feldner's book, how many years later, he calls the epics the Rucker Brothers Band. The Rucker Brothers Band? At the Live Oak Civic Center, Feldner started dancing, slow with a local girl. If Gainesville was something of a safe haven for long-haired musicians, outside of the town you were back in Florida. Feldner was forgetting this. While the Epics were playing, Feldner made a move and went outside with the girl. Before long, her boyfriend, drunk, became aware of the situation and set out to fix things in the old way. Feldner described himself at the time as being 125 pounds soaking wet. The girl's boyfriend is a linebacker. The fight was only just beginning when Feldner got his arm wrenched out of its socket. In a lot of pain, he signaled the Rutgers who were in the middle of a song. I saw it from the stage, Petty explains. This guy starts mixing it up with Feldner, and a circle forms around the fight. Rodney Rucker, our weed singer, weeps off the stage and straight into the middle of it. Then, of course, the fight grows. So Rick Rucker puts his guitar down, gets off the stage and into the middle of it, waving three of us up there playing music. The last straw to me was when our drummer got up and left the stage to get in it. That pretty much stopped the music, and when you stop the music, you've really got problems. Almost my whole band was in this fight, and the odds didn't look good. We didn't deny as fast as we could had to start getting our gear packed up, and somehow we got it. And the rest of the band into the car, with guys throwing at us as we pull away. It was scary. A couple cars followed us out of town. For me and for Tommy, it was kind of a turning point, I guess. We realized that these guys are just not with the same program we are. Feldner went away with a shoulder that still dislocates today. Where was he when this fight really got going? I was cowering in the corner. Adventures of that kind brought Petty and Wade in closer. They often met in the park between their houses to work out harmonies. If any one thing seemed to separate the decent bands from the really good ones, it was harmony singing. The two teenagers found that they had a good vocal blend and worked to make it better still. By their last year at Gainesville High, Petty and his friend Mike Nixon would be smoking before the start of school and leaving together not long after homeroom, sometimes bringing weed in along, going off to play music or listen to it or hang out with the other musicians. Leedon's and Petty's shared goal was in place early, to be in with a group of guys who all wanted it as much as they did. When Petty left the Epics for the first time, it was the only time he gave up, frustrated on that ambition to find a band that shared their view of the world and their ideas for what could be done with it.
Well, that's the end of chapter three. Let me know what you guys thought of chapter three in the comments below. That does it for today's video, guys. I hope you enjoyed. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. I really appreciate the support. I'll see you next time. Until then, rock on.